Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so our screencast for today is going to continue to focus on time period number five. Uh, in this screencast, we're going to focus solely on the era of Reconstruction, which lasts from 1865 to 1867. Uh, so it's a time period directly following the Civil War. Uh, and so what we're going to really focus on are some of the big questions we took a look at in class, like how is the North and South or the Union and the Confederacy rejoining together? Uh, and then what is the status of the newly freed men, African Americans? Uh, and what is the federal government doing to protect their rights uh, in this era of Reconstruction? So we're going to start with this whole idea of reunification. So if you remember, the election of 1860 precipitates uh, the southern, at least the lower south, seceding from the Union. And then after the firing upon Fort Sumter in 1861, the upper south also secedes from the Union. And they're going to form their own country called the Confederacy. Uh, those states that stay in, in, in the Union is, are, are known as uh, the Union states. And they remain a part of the United States of America. Uh, now, after the Civil War, the first big question is, how are they actually going to reintegrate uh, these Confederate states back into the Union? Will they assume full state status? Um, will they be able to send senators and congressmen to the legislative branch? Will they be able to vote? Um, all these things are like unknown questions at the time. And so they really have to kind of plan out um, how to reunify the nation together, not only just politically, but socially bring them back into the Union. Um, to heal the bitterness of the Civil War. So this is a big task in the Reconstruction time period. Now, if you look at it, there's really two major plans that is going to um, be employed during Reconstruction to not just reunify the nation, but to also deal with the newly freed men and um, either protect their rights or, uh, in President Johnson's plan's case, um, not really try to extend rights to African Americans. But um, really, you have two major plans. These are two different eras in Reconstruction. You have President Johnson's plan, um, and when he's taking the lead or s supposedly taking the lead in the early time period from about 1865 to 1867, this is known as presidential reconstruction. Then you have congressional reconstruction, which really kind of lasts from 1867. Um, depending on where you kind of draw that line, it really is to the end of reconstruction, uh, but we kind of carved out a s another time period in there called the redemption period. Uh, but this is where Congress is kind of taking the lead. I um, mean, you have a lot of your radical Republicans who are gaining a lot of influence during this congressional time period uh, of Reconstruction. Now, President Johnson's plan kind of closely follows Lincoln's plan that Lincoln came out with before he was assassinated called the 10% plan. And essentially, it's a pretty lenient plan towards the South. In order for these states to re-enter the Union, only 10% of the population had to pledge their loyalty to the United States. And that would allow them to resume um, you know, functioning order within the United States. Uh, and so essentially, Johnson wants to kind of follow that 10% plan. He wants to leave it pretty lenient. Uh, as far as African Americans are concerned, Johnson is really not interested in extending rights to African Americans in any major way. Uh, he wants to kind of uh, keep them in the same similar status that they had before the war, minus slavery. Uh, and so like Johnson actually is an advocate of the back to Africa idea of sending African Americans back to Africa. Uh, so he's really not interested in protecting uh, African Americans' rights. Now, as far as Congress is concerned, the radical Republicans are very interested in protecting African American rights. And so if you look here, um, first thing, as far as during radical reconstruction, what they do is they're going to carve out the South into military districts. And they're going to send Union troops back down to the South um, to occupy these different parts of the South to make sure that um, the laws are being followed, that African American rights are being protected, and while Congress is influencing Reconstruction, they have a really big um, push to extend more rights to African Americans. So we'll talk about this a little bit later in the screencast, but this is the era when they're going to pass the 14th and 15th Amendments. They're going to enforce the 13th Amendment, so they're going to um, require southern states, if they want to re-enter the Union, to ratify these different amendments. They want 50% of these populations to pledge their loyalty to the nation, so it's much stricter requirements from Congress. Okay, now, the South kind of interprets Reconstruction in a couple of different interesting ways. Um, when we talk about the South, we mean the Confederate states in the South. Uh, so the first thing that they kind of look at the Civil War as this lost cause, that is a temporary setback, um, but the South will kind of prevail through this. And this is kind of a, a pervasive mentality across the white South, this idea of looking at the Civil War as a lost cause or a lost attempt at, um, you know, in their eyes, like a second American revolution. Uh, and they're going to go through a time period called the redemption time period where 
uh, like Southerners, white Southerners, try to reclaim the South for, uh, you know, for white Southerners. Uh, and this is where you see the rise of white paramilitary groups like the KKK and the White League. Uh, and I think Mark Twain kind of sums it up pretty well. In the South, you know, the Civil War is the ultimate event in their lifetime. Um, and that extends for generations after the Civil War as well. Uh, and so uh, they're not so uh, keen on being reconstructed. And so there's going to be a lot of resistance to reconstruction in all different um, faculties during you know, this time period following the Civil War. Now, what eventually kind of ends this time period known as Reconstruction is the Compromise of 1877. Uh, and in this Compromise of 1877, you have two candidates running for the presidency. You have Rutherford B. Hayes and James Tilden. So Tilden is your Democratic candidate and Rutherford B. Hayes is your Republican candidate. Now, what ends up happening is there's a couple of states that are in dispute, um, all of which are Southern states, so Florida being one of them. Uh, and essentially what happens here is that technically um, they're won by the Republicans, uh, but the votes are, they're not 100% sure if they trust the votes, if, um, you know, uh, if they've actually won the states. So the, the, the election is kind of in dispute um, after November. Uh, and so what happens is really kind of Tilden and Hayes make this compromise amongst each other, and Tilden decides to not dispute the election. And in return, um, they kind of make like this uh, behind the scenes kind of exchange. So Hayes agrees to um, end Reconstruction and remove troops out of the South and Tilden kind of agrees to give up the presidency. Uh, and this, again, this quote kind of sums it up well. Um, this is a Southern quote basically saying that, you know, it matters very little to the Southerners and, and to these former Confederate states who's ruling Washington, as long as they're allowed to have home rule is what they call it. And essentially what they mean there is that they want the Democratic Party to retake the South and to be in control of the South, and they want white Southerners and former Confederates to have power within the South again. And they don't care, you know, if the Republican Party controls Washington, D.C., let them control the federal government. They want to control their state governments. Uh, so whether you really call this a compromise, I don't know if I really call it a compromise, but that's the official name for it, Compromise of 1877. Uh, and that's kind of how Reconstruction officially ends. Now, the other big question of Reconstruction is essentially um, how are you going to protect the rights of the newly freed men? Are you going to protect the rights of the newly freed men? What rights will be extended to African Americans throughout the country? Because now you have about a four to five million uh, person population that all of a sudden has gotten immediate emancipation and they're going to need a lot of services, a lot of help. Um, and you know, they have to discuss what rights will be extended to African Americans. So during presidential reconstruction in the beginning, as we said, President Johnson is not interested really in protecting African Americans' rights. Uh, and so he lays out a very lenient plan towards the South and towards the Confederate, uh, former Confederate states. And a lot of the Confederate states kind of see this as a signal um, that it's, um, they're going to try and reinforce some of their old rules from before. So they're going to pass a lot of these laws called black codes. And black codes are special laws and designations for African Americans. Uh, and a lot of what the southern states did is they just took their old slave codes and they replaced the word slave with the word Negro. Uh, and they just kind of essentially uh, made special laws for African Americans, restricting their movements, restricting where they could go. Um, restricting their status in society and essentially giving them second class status within American society. So yes, they were technically free, but not in reality. Uh, so when you look at uh, these codes, they don't last for a significant amount of time, but they're important because it shows you kind of the Southern mentality of trying to uh, roll back any form of reconstruction that's potentially happening in the country. Now. Uh, during this whole time period, beginning under presidential reconstruction and kind of continuing during congressional reconstruction is the creation of an, uh, an organization called the Freedmen's Bureau. So the Freedmen's Bureau is really a creation of Congress, even though it begins under presidential reconstruction. Now, essentially what this organization was supposed to do was help former slaves transition to free life uh, and socially help them, economically help them. So. Uh, it's the first kind of, I guess, America's foray into um, social services. Uh, and you have this huge population that's greatly in need of uh, some social services. 
So one of the big, some of the big successes you can kind of take a look at from the Freedmen's Bureau. First big one you want to associate with success is education. So if you look at the South, they're able to build a lot of schools throughout the South and help, um, you know, these newly freed men uh, get some form of an education. Uh, even to the extent that they build a lot of colleges um, for, you know, uh, that are now known as the historically black colleges, but a lot of those were built during the Reconstruction time period. Um, so that's one considered to be one of the great successes of Freedmen's Bureau. Um, now, failures on the other hand, first one is African Americans largely wanted to, to gain land after the Civil War was over. So what they were looking for was what's called 40 acres and a mule. Uh, which is what they wanted. They wanted a small piece of land, 40 acres, and they wanted a mule to help them work the land because they wanted financial independence. But this was never granted them. There was no wide-scale um, land redistribution or effort to provide African Americans with a piece of property. What they did instead was this system of sharecropping. So if you notice, I put sharecropping in both success side and the failure side. Um, I think most of us would largely put sharecropping in the failure side, but I put it in the success side because of a few reasons as well. So on the sharecropping, the failure side, um, if you look at this uh, institution of sharecropping, what it does is it kind of creates like a renting-based system throughout the South uh, where African Americans could stay on the land, they could work the land, and usually they would stay on potentially you know, their former master's land, um, they would get like a small plot to work uh, and essentially um, they would work the land and give a portion of their crops to their landlord uh, and the remaining crops they could keep for themselves to potentially uh, sell and make a profit and maybe eventually buy their own land. Now why most of us would probably put this in the failure side of you know an institution that the Freedmen's Bureau helped to oversee was that a lot of African Americans got stuck in the system of sharecropping and what happened was they got stuck in a cycle of debt because of sharecropping and essentially um, a lot of them never get out of it and so uh, economically it keeps them dependent on like the white land establishment throughout the south and so like for that reason a lot of us would kind of throw it into the failure category. Now some aspects of it that are successful though is that it does give African Americans a semi degree of, of independence. They are, it's, it's a step up from the system that they were under, which was, you know, uh, the slave labor system. And essentially, they do have their own independence. They are working in family units. Uh, and so potentially some former slaves can use this system to buy their own piece of land, and some do. It depends on, you know, how fair your sharecropping contract was that you were able to sign. In the beginning, the Freedmen's Bureau kind of oversees them. Later on, African Americans are kind of up, left up to themselves to kind of um, negotiate these contracts. Okay, the last big thing we're going to kind of take a look at are the Reconstruction Amendments, which are a huge part of uh, what Congress is able to implement during the Reconstruction time period. So these are the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendments. The 13th Amendment abolishes slavery throughout the United States, so makes slavery illegal. Um, the 14th Amendment uh, provides equal protection under the law, so there's no, the, it kind of makes black codes illegal to have different laws for African Americans and white Americans. Um, so it's equal protection under the law, everybody's the same under the law, and then also creates the idea of birthright citizenship, um, where, you know, you're a citizen of the country if you are born here in the United States. Uh, and so we talked about how that's potentially contentious today. Um, with different things that are going on and like illegal immigration, but at the time it's meant for African Americans so they couldn't be excluded from citizenship based off of their race. And then you have the 15th Amendment, which grants African, African American men the right to vote, so they get suffrage. Uh, so you have the 13th, which abolishes slavery, 14th, which grants equal protection under the law and birthright citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, which, amendment, which grants African American men uh, the right to vote. So these are, you know, your principal uh, reconstruction amendments that are created um, by, you know, Congress during the time period. And so for a short time period there, while you have military rule throughout the South, these rights are protected for African Americans. And so it's a big step forward. And you can see even a lot of African Americans are able to get elected to state legislatures and to the federal government as House representative members and senators. Now, the thing we're going to talk about in our next era, in the New South era, is that a lot of these things are rolled back once Reconstruction ends.
Okay, so we're going to stop there. Our next screencast will pick up with time period six.